Madeline is 13 years old. She has been missing since 8.30 on Monday morning when mom's boyfriend dropped her off near Hunters Creek uh, Middle School. Told her have a good day at school when she got out. I love her. I said, thanks, love you too. What was it? We don't know where she is. We don't know if she's safe. We just wanted a baby girl back. Maddie, if you see this, please come home. Please be safe. Just one day after the body of 13-year-old Maddie Soto was found, the prime suspect in her disappearance, he's now facing sexual battery and child pornography charges, but has not so far yet been charged in Maddie's death. Search teams finally recovered Maddie's body Friday evening after an exhaustive search through the woods in Osceola County. Madeline Soto, a beautiful blonde hair, blue-eyed young girl, had just celebrated her 13th birthday on February 2nd of 2024. On her 13th birthday, the family had come together to celebrate Madeline, and it was a fruitful time for her. She was so happy. She had a big, beautiful teenage smile and received lots of gifts with a beautiful cake that had the number 13. But Madeline told friends that when she turned 13 years old, she wanted to go live in the woods. Most 13-year-old children are not considering an escape from their home by the age of 13 unless there is something wrong. Children want security and love. But what's more upsetting than her fantasies or potential plot to escape at such an early age was how it came to be discovered that she had been feeling this way. It wasn't like she just went up to her parents and said it. No, this discovery came to be known during their investigation for her disappearance. Why would a child who disappears create a goal to escape before their disappearance? We have a lot to uncover in the case of Madeline Soto. I'm Chelsea J. Welcome to Crime Light. So if you're new here, then welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Don't forget to check out Spotify and Apple where I do Crime Light, the podcast. Totally different content over there than I feature here on YouTube. So there are worse things that can happen to a person, but can we all just agree that it is painful to be abused by someone you love and you trust? You never forget the experience. And that's what the case of Madeline Soto is all about. The reality that someone she was supposed to be able to love and trust as a mentor and a leader to her would turn out to be an absolute garbage human. And that's because people who hurt children are garbage human beings. Let's discover the depths of Madeline's warning signs of wanting to escape something in her life just here real quick. A very good article that I discovered covers this and the article is actually called Reasons Why a Traumatized Child Runs Away. The article deep dives into different theories of what it could mean when a child says, hey, I want to leave, run away. And not to Disneyland. Madeline wasn't talking about a mansion or a, you know, rainforest with beautiful butterflies and rainbows or waterfalls, you guys. Madeline said the woods. The woods! Like dirt, tree stumps, shade. But maybe there was something to that. Like protection, in other words. The message of anywhere but here. Here meaning wherever she was within the home of her family. So within this article, theory one is the obvious. This might just be a sign that the child has a healthy curiosity of what else might be out there. Is it the age where they're trying to run away toward the age of independence? Once I ran to you, now I'll run away from you, as the lyrics to the song Tainted Love do say. Theory two, a traumatized child may have far more troubling connections with the impulse to run away. Trauma happens when a person is faced with a frightening situation that is impossible to escape from. The powerlessness leads to overwhelming terror, which is traumatizing. The body is unable to escape, leaving the mind and the body unprotected from terror of whatever is happening happening. So I'm going to go with theory two because, well, none of this ends well at all. And if a 13-year-old is saying the woods, 
that's where I want to go, the woods, and not like an amusement park, then we have an obvious concern here. I want to run away to the woods is like the cousin to the term, I want to crawl under a rock. And so it's really important to identify in a child like Madeline when the statement such as, I'm 13, I want to run away to the woods, gets mentioned. Why the woods of all places? Why did she view turning 13 as an opportune time to say something like this? And most of all, why did Madeline withhold sharing these thoughts from her, I would say mother, but family? Could the crime that happened to Madeline in this tragedy that I'm gonna talk about could it have been prevented? As a starting point, let's take a look at what happened. Allegedly, on Monday, February 26 of 2024, Jennifer Soto's boyfriend, pronounced Stefan Stearns, age 37, drove Madeline Soto to school. Stefan Stearns dropped her off a few blocks from Hunter's Creek Middle School near Peace United Methodist Church on Town Loop Boulevard, just said to be a few blocks or so away from the school property. It's said that Madeline Soto may have felt embarrassed by the vehicle that Stefan Stearns drove, and I get that. She's 13 now. Stepdad's car looks like a junker. And you're gonna hear in a moment from Jennifer Soto, Madeline's mother, saying that at one point, Madeline was possibly diagnosed with autism. Now, most of you know that I am an autism mom, and this is very serious to me when autism or autistic tendencies are within the very being of a human because these are very trusting people to begin. Now, I promise you I'm not gonna make the whole thing about autism, especially because Jennifer ends up with a counterpoint. We, you know, come to find out that she wasn't autistic, but she only had the tendencies. So at one point, her daughter's diagnosed with it. In another point, she says, we found out that's not the case. Listen, either way, children, autistic or not, are extremely vulnerable, trusting beings. But, you know, when you add autism or autistic tendencies to that, then there does tend to be more dependency needed there between the child and the guardian. So what I'm trying to say here is it's really interesting that Stefan validated that it was a good idea to drop Madeline off at a nearby church, like almost a half mile away, off the actual school property, instead of actually just realizing she's only 13 years old. She's barely a teenager. She's got some dependency things that she's going through dealing with, and it's probably in her best interest to take her to the actual school. And I just found that to be incredibly odd that this was part of their story. In a moment, we're going to come to find out that's a little bit irrelevant to the entire case. Just bear with me. However, it does start to dictate a little bit how the family uh, kind of handled dealing with Madeline. Like they knew she had certain needs, but they weren't maybe quite being met. And it's from there that Stearns agreed um, to pick up Madeline and bring her to school. Now, he doesn't take her all the way to school. Let me show you where he claims he dropped off Madeline. It's the Peace United Methodist Preschool. It's about five miles from the apartment where you can see right there. Uh, but he claims that she was embarrassed about being dropped off at her middle school and asked to be dropped off there. And he says that he did it at about 8.40 in the morning. So let me show you where her school is now, the middle school. It's Hunter, Hunter's Creek Middle School. It's about a 0.4 mile walk from where he dropped her off. And class was set to begin at 9.30, which would give her time to get there, obviously. Madeline was said to have been wearing a green hoodie sweatshirt, black shorts, and white Crocs, wearing a floral Jansport backpack. Now, in my last video, I explained I always try to go to the victim's mom. I personally give benefits to the mother because she knows her child best. You know, she can tell us things that nobody else can really tell us, such as habits, the nature of the child, a normal day, abnormal habits, and such. So in this next video that we're about to see, be sure to notice how Stefan makes his presence known and so obviously, as we learn what Jennifer had come to know about her daughter, Madeline, missing. Let's take a look. Monday morning, we took her to school. We dropped her off close to school, across the street from a church, which is very 
it's right next to the school. Um, she crossed the street um, and walked to school, what we thought walked to school. Um, my boyfriend who drove her to school walk, drove away at that point. It was seen on video footage that she hung out in the parking lot of the church for a few minutes and then got up and walked towards the school, but she never made it that walk from, and that was around 9 a.m. when she got up. Uh, she never made it to school after that. Um, it's right next to the school. I don't know why she didn't make it. I don't know if something happened on her walk along the way or if she got taken, but she never made it. I went to pick her up after school and she wasn't there. Um, so I started driving around, trying, maybe thinking she took a walk. Maybe she decided to walk to my mom's office, which is pretty close to the school as well. <sighs> drove around and I didn't see anything. I drove back to the school, the school was closed. I emailed one of her teachers. They confirmed that she was absent all day. At that point is when I called 911 because I realized something was truly wrong. She hasn't been active on social media, none of her chats, none of her games. Uh, we did contact all her friends. None of them had seen her Monday or heard from her. And I have to ask this, and I know I, I hate doing it, but is she the type that would run away? Has this happened in the past or anything? Has she ever threatened to run away? Never. She's never, ever mentioned anything like this before. And she's not the type to want to do this. She did accidentally leave her phone on Monday, which is kind of normal for her. She's got ADHD and very forgetful. So she left her phone at home. So there's no way to trace her. They tried tracing her school laptop, um, but that's off. So it's not pinging to anything. Jen, what, what is your fear? I know you mentioned she's on games and stuff. Do you think she could have like met somebody and tried to meet up with them? She's open to us. She's open with us about, you know, if she's got a crush with anyone. And she told us she had a crush on someone at school. Um, and I looked at their messages. Nothing was weird. I looked at all of her messages, all of her deleted messages. Nothing seemed weird. It didn't seem like she was talking to anyone. Um, so I don't feel like that's the case. I feel like she may have been taken um, because this is not like her at all to just disappear and not tell us, not let us know where she's going or who she's with. What What are you getting from law enforcement? Are, I mean, are they actively searching for her? I mean, what, what happens now? I mean, especially that she doesn't have her phone with her. Um, so as far as I know, they're conducting a search around the school, behind the school. There's a Shingle Creek. There's a... a wooded path area that you could walk. Uh, it's a hiking path. They are going back there with their canine dogs. Uh, they've taken a piece of her clothing to see if they can trace her scent. They're also taking their own vehicles. I'm not sure what type of vehicles, but they're going into the woods to search for her. But I don't feel like that's going to find anything right now. We've had people all day on that trail sending us photos to see if anything there looks familiar and like her personal belongings and nothing is hers. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure where to go from here. I'm just contacting the news to get the word out, to get some help because I'm desperate. I, I'm a wreck right now. I'm trying to hope for the best, but I'm just, I'm scared for her. I want her to be okay. I want her to be safe. I don't want, to, I don't want her to come back harmed. I, I just, I just want her back whatever that means just i just want her back and jen there's no way that she just being you know a teenager was like maybe had a fight with you or an argument with you and was like you know what i'm gonna go hang out at so-and-so's house and teach her a lesson you know the, could that be a scenario i don't believe so we actually haven't gotten into a fight in like a few weeks or arguments or anything like that if anything, on Sunday, she celebrated her 13th birthday with my entire family and she had the best day. She was so happy. She showed us all her gifts. She was, she's just a happy girl and she showed it on, on Sunday night when she went to bed. She was so happy. So, you know, she had the best day. You know, there was no, there was no moment in that evening from when she got home from the party that she had her phone or had the laptop. She went straight to getting ready and went to bed. So I know she didn't have any conversations with anyone. She didn't make plans with anyone. I didn't, I didn't see any of that. Spent the whole Sunday celebrating her 13th birthday. Was her 13th birthday on that Sunday or that was just like the, the time you guys were celebrating? That was the time we were celebrating. Her birthday was on Thursday, the 22nd. Okay, she just so turned 13. 
But that's just so heartbreaking to be celebrating her 13th birthday and then the very next day, She's that's gone. the last you, you see it, you've seen of her. I mean, where, where do you go now? Are you going to go out there and, and search or look or what, what is your, are you sticking by the phone? Are you, you know, what are you doing? I'm staying at home, staying by the phone, hoping she just appears. Um, I know my entire family is out looking. They've all uh, spread a bunch of flyers. They've gone, I, I've had people contact me that they've gone to the international airport to spread flyers, to Amtrak, to Greyhound, any way that if someone's taken her and they're trying to take her just to show her face, just to make sure you know she's not being taken against her will and you mentioned adhd was there anything else maybe mentally going on or that that you knew of um she does suffer from anxiety and once upon a time she was diagnosed with autism uh we had her re brained maybe evaluated okay we had her reevaluated um a few months ago actually and they told us, no, she didn't have autism, but she did have some autistic traits. She did have ADHD, some autistic traits, but not autism. So I'm not sure where to leave with that because one doctor said she did and one doctor saying she doesn't. And I don't know, she's just in the middle, I guess, She because she does have some tendencies, but socially she's pretty great. And with the video that you were able to see whenever your boyfriend dropped her off, where, where was that? What, like which video, was that a surveillance camera? It was a surveillance camera from the church, uh, Peace Church, right next to Med uh, Hunters Creek Middle School. And do you have that video? I don't have that. Um, they didn't show me. They wouldn't show me. They, it was actually, they, they, my sister was the one at location and they were letting her know what they saw on camera. Maddie, if you see this, please come home. Please be safe. I love you very much. If you have my Maddie, please just let her come home. We just want her home. All right. Uh, well, good afternoon. So uh, thank you for being here um, so we can bring as much attention as possible to the case of uh, missing juvenile Madeline Soto. You know, I know as a parent, this is every parent's worst nightmare. Uh, many of our detectives and deputies who are working the case, uh, they also have children. Um, so they're working extra hard to find Madeline. We can't even imagine uh, the pain and anguish that Madeline's family is going through. But I do want to assure the community that we have well over uh, 100 deputies, detectives, uh, intelligence analysts, and specialized personnel who are investigating this case and searching for Madeline uh, right now. So uh, we started the investigation uh, that night, uh, started canvassing the area looking for any witnesses uh, or surveillance video later that evening uh, while we were doing an investigation we did obtain um, an article of madeline from the house we called our bloodhound the bloodhound did uh, an extensive search which unfortunately did not provide any results uh, about her whereabouts so our missing persons uh, detectives responded to take over the investigation so they did uh, interviews with mom, mom's boyfriend, Madeline's friends uh, from school. Uh, we were able to access Madeline's phone and there is information on the phone uh, that indicated that she told people when she turned 13, which was on February 22nd, she actually wanted to go live in the woods. Uh, so that was in her phone. Uh, one thing we do in all missing person cases, especially missing juveniles, our uh, sex offender surveillance squad uh, goes out and makes contact with every single sex offender in the area. So a couple of things here, issues. Out here in California, we get notified right away if our children are not in school. Okay, so I have two kids. One child's in the district, one child's not. They go to totally different schools. And obviously on occasion, we get sick or maybe we've left town or there's, you know, some kind of medical appointment. And I get a call and an email or a text before the end of school day, straight up telling me that my child is absent. My child did not make it through the gates. They are not in class. They are not on the premises. My child has not checked in. We get emails out here where I'm from right away. And mind you, 
One child's in elementary school and the other child is in middle school. So it really doesn't make a difference because that's about to come into play. Like the fact that Madeline's mother didn't end up discovering that she was not at school until she had to go to the school to find that out on her own rather than getting a phone call during the day telling her, hey, this is the school, Madeline is not here today. So that's what happened. Madeline's mother, Jennifer, she goes to the school at 4.30 like any normal day and she goes to pick up Madeline and she figures out 4.30 all day long that her daughter never showed up. And obviously this caused a lot of concern within the districts of Florida. It looks bad when a mother like Jennifer is at work or wherever she's at thinking that her child is safe and sound at school and has to figure out later than sooner that her child never made it to school. Okay, so Hunter Creek Middle School falls under Orange County in Florida and officials in Orange County said, the district considers a student absent when they miss more than a half of a school day. The final cutoff for the teachers to submit attendance is at 3.30 p.m. Once attendance is finalized in the system, a report is run and the message is sent out to the families. So they have answered for this. They, they've said, you know, uh, we, we cannot take responsibility here because of how our protocol is for this particular school in this particular county. They ended up coming out and saying, you know what, uh, schools do things very differently. Districts are different. Also come to find out for this particular school, there was a policy in place that parents are supposed to be dropping their children off on property. And so there was a reminder that was released in a statement that said, you know, reminder that we have this policy in place for a reason. It is best to make sure that the child is dropped off on the actual premises. Because right now they're thinking that Madeline was dropped off at a church almost a half mile away. And at some point between the church premises and the premises of the school, like at that point, somewhere in there, that walk, she didn't make it. That's what they're under the assumption of. And so, yeah, that, that was brought up as a reminder. That policy was in place for a reason. So notice how the boyfriend, Stefan, is lingering in the back. And Jennifer says that Madeline forgot her cell phone, which Jennifer backs. It's pretty normal for Madeline to forget her things, you know, she's got some memory uh, struggles, she's ADHD, she kind of thinks nothing of it. All right, so in my home, we just dealt with this in our family, my preteen and the cell phone thing. Well, you know, around these parts, it's been harder to forget the phone. Like I have to remind her to forget the phone and live her life without it. So I happen to think differently about Madeline not having her phone on this particular day. She is 13. That's kind of weird, right? Like, why would a 13-year-old that obviously engages with her friends and, and, and so much so that she's confiding and saying, you know what, I want to go to the woods. That's just so strange to me that she would forget it. So guess what? I wasn't there. So maybe she did forget her phone. Or maybe the perpetrator just didn't want her to have it. Okay, so Jennifer goes back to pick Madeline up at 4.30 from Hunters Creek Middle School and Madeline never showed up at the school that day. Between the time that Jennifer learned at 4.30 that Madeline was missing and the police go to meet Jennifer at the school about Madeline missing at 8 p.m., right? Like that's, that's a pretty big gap. Madeline's mother took that time to go starting from the school. She went to Madeline's grandmother's business, which was close by because she thought maybe she walked over there instead. I mean, just, you know, guessing. I'll check, she's not there. So then she goes back to the school and the school was closed by then. And so then she takes that next step. Well, you know, I'm just gonna make sure, like, let me just double check with Madeline's teachers. I'm gonna send them an email emails them, gets confirmation. That's correct. She has not been at school today. And so the police allegedly told her that they had nobody available to come out and meet with her. And so they would send someone as soon as possible. So between 4.30 and 8 p.m., that's what ended up happening. She's reaching out to everybody. She's on the lookout. She's waiting for a deputy to come meet her at the school. And listen, this is where I personally agree that something needs to change here and should happen with the school notifying a parent a lot sooner because in my opinion, things could have been different in this case 
a lot sooner had Jennifer known earlier. It should scare parents that a mom didn't realize her child never checked into school until nine hours later. 8 to 4.30, that's nuts. And an example, if something bad is happening with a crime regarding a child, nine hours is a lot of time for a perpetrator to do a lot of different things. See, now because she wasn't notified earlier, and I understand the protocol, I respect that, but it definitely uh, was kind of an error because now Jennifer's going to the school that's closed. She's reaching out to the teachers after hours that, you know, probably have other things going on. You know, they've got a family, sports, therapy. I don't know what they're doing after school, but they've got a life to live too, right? They leave the school. Now she has to wait. She has to wait for them to contact her and confirm things. It's getting darker out. A whole full day has gone by. And she says that she called the police, but they couldn't get anyone to her for hours. And if that's the case, then that would be a whole 12 hours that a child would have been missing, you know, for something really bad to be happening. So I'm really hoping that the school system might, you know, uh, take this a little more seriously, make some changes. So Jennifer is shaken up. Let's see how Stefan feels about the fact that he was the last person within that family to have seen Madeline allegedly ever again. By the way, please note the Chris Watts vibes here where he goes back and forth between present tense and past tense verbiage on what kind of a person that he felt Madeline was. And does he actually really cry? Let's take a look here. I dropped her off. Everything looked fine when I drove away. It's the last time we saw her. What were the conversations that y'all had in the car when you dropped her off? Not much. She was asleep for most of the way. Told her have a good day at school when she got out. I love her. I said thanks. Love you too. What was it? And so, where, where, where do you think she could possibly be? I mean, this isn't. As I was told, this isn't normal behavior. This is not normal behavior. She's not the type that would just run off. We don't know where she can be. We're scared. We just want her home. Are you, in a sense, blaming yourself? It's hard not to. It just keeps coming in waves. This is the reality keeps hitting. We don't know where she is. We don't know if she's safe. We're just scared. We just want her home. Conflicting reports here and there. People say they see this or that. None of it's conclusive and none of it's helpful. We just want a baby girl back. By Tuesday, February 27th, the next day, Madeline Soto's missing poster was released. Sheriff John Mina said over 100 personnel, including detectives, deputies, intelligence analysts, specialized personnel, and bloodhounds, were out searching for Madeline. Regarding the bloodhounds, her family had given over some of Madeline's belongings or a piece of belonging for the scent, but nothing was actually detected. Guys, uh, joining me right now, I'm hearing in my ear, Dr. Trace Sargent, search rescue recovery expert, and spent a great deal. This is how I met her. She's an expert canine handler. It's interesting listening to the timeline here. That is an important factor when we look at all these different resources, specifically for dogs. Dogs have this incredible, amazing ability to detect scent. However, it's important for listeners to know that scent, if you look at it from the perspective of a living organism, it comes to life, it has a life cycle, and then it dies out. And there are many factors that can either accelerate or decelerate that lifespan of scent. Describing the scene of where Maddie was last seen, it was very uh, urban, concrete, asphalt, a lot of vehicles. Even though it wasn't super, super hot, it was still sunny uh, type of weather. It wasn't raining. It was dry conditions. All of those factors is going to have a negative effect on scent. And the bottom line is this. No matter how good a dog is, if scent isn't there, they're not going to detect it because there isn't any scent there. If we don't pick up scent in an area, and it's really very fortunate that we have any video 
uh, surveillance that shows that Maddie was in the area. So that is a big, big plus that we as dog handlers have what we call a starting point. Uh, and then the dogs can determine a direction of travel, pick up the scent, and then follow that person's scent to hopefully where they are. In this case, if the dogs are not able to pick it up, you have to say, okay, did Maddie get into a vehicle with someone? Or I'm going, if I was working this, I would put my dog in a situation where if Maddie is in the area and we can't see her with our eyes, I'm going to use my dog for that. Let's say in a wooded area or in a, uh, maybe hidden in a building or something like that where we visually can't see her. Also, if I put the dogs, let's say, in a wooded area, there's a higher likelihood that scent is going to be more contained there because of the vegetation, the grass, the trees, the canopy of the vegetation and trees. All of those factors are going to help scent stay alive, even after hours or days later. So just because the dog team doesn't find scent at that exact location, there are still alternatives to use that resource, but it also raises other questions. Is Maddie not in the area? Has she been picked up? Is she, uh, is, because my thought is that if she's in the area and let's say she's fallen down and hurt, uh, her scent is absolutely going to be quite strong in what we call a scent pool. So if we're looking here now four or five days later, she's lying there in the woods, her scent pool is going to be extremely strong for, for the dogs to detect and be able to go to her. Now, during Stefan's interview, he provided consent for his phone to be checked. However, he admitted that an accidental factory reset had been performed. Yeah, accidental. That's what he said. The timing, ironically, was February 26 of 2024, which was Madeline's official date of being discovered as a missing child. So yeah, accidental. Now really quickly, this case has been unfolding for the last few weeks. Day by day, there has been a bunch of new information that has been releasing as the investigation goes on. And so there has been more breaking news. So let me go ahead and reveal to you what I just found out. Here we go. Upon reviewing the contents of Stefan's phone, several images and videos were located which depicted an apparent child. And then it references her private uh, uh, regions, her, her upper private regions, lower uh, private regions, and, and the private regions behind, um, and the videos and pictures. There are also pictures and videos depicting an apparent child's um, private parts um, and <sighs> horrific assaults. That's all I'm going to say. Um, the, this warrant is to charge that the act occurred on August of 2022 when the victim was 11 years old. Remember that picture I showed you of her birthday? She was 13. This goes back to when she was 11. Based on the totality of the circumstances, you're a fine, that's the detective, has probable cause to believe Stefan committed a sexual battery on the victim when the victim was under 12 years old. She's been suffering for years, years. This monster's been in her house. Remember, these, these images that they find on his phone after he had accidentally done a factory reset on them, by the way. That's what he told investigators. Oh, he, yeah, you can take a look at my phone, but I accidentally did a factory reset. They still got the information. Um, previously, detectives of the uh, Orange County Sheriff's Office were executing a search warrant at Stefan's home address. This address is also where the victim, her mother, and Stefan live. They took images of the layout of the residence, okay? So there's pictures of, of, of the house. Based upon a review of the images from OCSO, execution of the search warrant at the residence, the room pictured in the images from August of 2022, these are on an 11-year-old girl match the rooms in that residence. So now we know the scene of the alleged sex crimes which were on his phone, allegedly. It's the house. What about that house? What kind of house is it? It's a condo. It's an end unit. 
two floors, four bedrooms, three bathrooms, about 1,400 square feet. It's a nice little complex, but it's not a huge house, right? Two, two levels, 1,400 square feet. What is this relationship, Stefan Stearns and, the, and, this, and this girl, this victim, uh, the mother, okay? This is in the affidavit of the officer. The mother advised her daughter's stepfather, Stefan Stearns, picked her up from home and dropped her off at Hunters Creek Middle School. So that's what she, when, she's, when this is still a missing persons case, that's what she says, that it's the stepfather. But they're not married. They've been together, um, I think, for years at this point, because we know the alleged uh, abuse goes back years. But the mother refers to him as the stepfather. I wonder if she called him dad. Did she call him dad? Is, it, is this a cover? Is this trying to make it look like, oh, we're a normal family, nothing to see here? Or is that legitimately the way this family was functioning and operating? While her name remains blacked out in the new court filings, which is something I'm gonna get to, guys. One affidavit mentions Madeline's birth date and another refers to the victim as the missing juvenile. The affidavits also describe the sexual attacks by Stefan Stearns. The abuse took place between February 2022 and February 2024, a time frame starting when the girl was 11 to around the time she went missing. Investigators said this in the affidavits. The documents offer specifics about two separate incidents depicted in the videos and photos found on Stefan Stern's phone, one that took place in August of 2022 when Madeline was 11 and another at an unspecified time when she was 12. In a press conference last week, Orange County Sheriff John Mina said a search of Madeline's phone, which she left at home the morning she went missing, discovered messages to friends saying she planned to live in the woods when she turned 13. Madeline's mother, Jen Soto, has not been identified as a suspect in the disappearance of her death. Well, that's going to say a lot about my final thoughts of this video. Let's go ahead and get into the affidavit. Again, that was so heavy. I'm gonna go ahead and censor what I'm about to read to you, so, and it's a trigger warning. State of Florida versus Stefan Michael Stearns. It discusses his age, his home address, that he is a Caucasian, six foot two, 220 pounds, black hair, brown eyes. And I just wanted to mention really quickly that Madeline is only 13 years old. She is also Caucasian, blonde hair, blue eyed, five foot one, and only 110 pounds. So this is what she had to work with was this six foot two, 220 pound man. On February 26th of 2024, it's blacked out, but we know Madeline was reported missing by her mother. And it just goes into, in the top part, the fact that she, Jennifer the mother, goes to the school, looks for her daughter, and realizes that she never made it. During an interview with Stefan, he provided consent to search his phone. However, he stated he had accidentally performed a factory reset on his phone on February 26 of 2024, the same day that, and it's blacked out, but Madeline went missing. The affidavit then goes on to mention on the top that it was unusual for blacked out, but we know Madeline to be dropped off down the street from the school and not stay in communication with family and friends. Upon reviewing the contents in Stefan's phone, several images and videos were located and it is blacked out, but it goes on to describe, as you can see here, different body parts as the focal point of the pictures and videos. There were also pictures and videos depicting and it's blacked out, but it talks about SA with whoever is in the visuals. As such, the files depict the SA performance of a child. It is believed that Stefan was in possession of material depicting an SA performance with a minor, a child. It should be noted that Stefan's privates are observed penetrating and it's blacked out, and that the private areas had distinct markings on it, which consisted of different colors of the skin below the head of his privates, until approximately a quarter of the length down the shaft of his privates. Several other photos capturing this distinct pattern were observed in the phone. 
Furthermore, after reviewing the photos and videos, I was observing several different pieces of clothing, including patterned underwear, shirts, blankets, and sheets. Then it goes into very, very graphic, disturbing, dark, twisted, detail that is blacked out so we cannot see what is there. But then the affidavit ends with, based on the circumstances that he's found in the phone, Detective Brian Moore then believes that Stefan committed that word there, essay, but worse, on, and then it's blacked out. So it's pretty apparent who the victim of circumstance happens to be in this case. Now, I just want y'all to know that I desperately feel like I need a shower right now. This is so difficult to talk about. It's, it's a hard case. This is, this is hard. This is hard. So again, I'm going to carry through because the message is so important with the breaking news that we just had regarding what they've discovered and what they're releasing to us, like two years. My God. So Stefan Stearns has not been charged with the crime of Madeline's murder. They only have Stefan on the crimes based on the evidence that they've found in his phone. Video evidence obtained by police show Stefan Stearns discarding items in a dumpster at a Kesame apartment complex at 7.45 a.m. on February 26th, also the day Madeline's phone was left behind, forgotten, and her mother's words, because she has ADHD, this is typical, and that these items were later recovered and identified as Madeline's backpack and school-issued laptop. So that just changed everything now, doesn't it? That obviously means that she probably never made it to school for a reason. Why would he be throwing her items away on February 26th at 7.45 a.m. when school starts at 9.30 a.m. and he was said to have dropped her very far away, like almost a half mile away from the property of the school where she will be attending without her things because they're in the trash. But she didn't make it and her things were in the trash. There's also video evidence of Stefan Stearns returning to his neighborhood with Madeline visible in his vehicle. However, authorities believe now that Madeline was already deceased at that time. Okay, but in her interview with WFTV, Jen Soto, the mom, claims that Madeline was spotted on camera after police, as you heard, believe she's already dead. Take a listen. We dropped her off at school, close to school. Um, she wanted to walk the rest of the way. Um, I'm not sure what I'm allowed to share. You can share whatever you feel comfortable sharing. I know you had conversations with detectives. Um, not sure what that conversation is, but whatever you feel comfortable sharing that will put the awareness out there. Yeah, she was uh, spotted walking uh, by the church, by the middle school uh, on the cameras. They saw her hang out in the parking lot for a little bit and then get up and leave. They didn't see a vehicle or anything else. They just saw her walk away uh, around 9 a.m. heading towards the school but she never made it. I'm confused. She, and it, it seems she's getting that information from detectives, but they say that she's dead at 819, but they're telling her that they have video of her walking around at the church. You know, the problem, if you lie, you have to remember what you said, and she's not doing a very good job of remembering what she said. There's a missing child, right. and she's putting out information that her daughter was seen walking. She also said, we, mm -hmm. we dropped her off. Yep. She didn't. And she later said, it, and why is she saying we? Because, why is she saying any of this? I mean, it's, she, this is gonna be introduced by the prosecution at their trials and it's going to sink them. And this is exactly why- So you why believe mom might be on the hook here? Is, there's so. agreement across the board here? No, Absolutely. I don't think she might be on the hook. I think she is on the hook. All right. Hook, line, and sinker. Madeline's body was discovered in a wooded area on March 1st of 2024. And breaking news at six, sources just confirmed at Channel 9, the body of missing 13-year-old Madeline Soto has been found. We have learned that a tip called in after this afternoon's press conference with Orange County Sheriff John Mina led detectives to her body. Law enforcement from several agencies still out at the scene right there 
off of Hickory Tree Road in Osceola County. So we're on the other side of this field on Hickory Tree Road. We're going to zoom in all the way to where deputies have set up a light. We can see a couple cars with the flashing lights. Hickory Tree Road shut down for a good couple mile stretch. We're inside of that perimeter right now as we watch them somewhat do their investigation. We're going to take you to our view from Sky Witness 9, uh, showing you the scene from above a slightly better view. You can see a long line of vehicles on the side of the road there. They appear to be focusing their efforts on the woods just off to the side of the road. But again, uh, a lot uh, hidden from our view as we watch this unfold. Video evidence uh, put her body in Stephen Cerns' car uh, Monday morning when he was supposed to be dropping her off at school. They said they found her laptop from school as well as her backpack in a dumpster in the apartment complex where they lived and they said all of that evidence led them to conclude that she was not alive it's not a search operation as it was a recovery operation at this point deputies and police officers swarm different parts of the area a couple of different times lucking uh, no luck for the first couple but then we landed here on hickory tree road down the road from where officers uh, and deputies said that they'd images of stearns's car from the day madeline disappeared uh, they said that they were on the lookout and asking anybody to be on the lookout because they had those images. They knew that he was here and that he had gotten a flat tire at some point and they expected him to have changed that, somebody to have seen it. They uh, came to this location uh, where they found her body about uh, an hour or so ago now. The main suspect who you see here in her disappearance, Stephen Stearns, was taken from the Orange County Jail to the Osceola County Jail. The detectives here are doing a good job and a bad job. You know why they did a bad job? They arrested him for the child, the stuff that's on his phone. They never should have done that. Why should they never have done that? Don't tell them that they have that information. Bring him in, question him. Now he's all lawyered up. Now they're never going to talk to him about her, you know, her missing, her whereabouts. What he did that day. What did you do? You drop her off. Don't charge him. Hey, we want to bring you in. We want to talk to you about where she was. I'm going I'm to rehearse what happened when you dropped her off. Rehearse what happened when you dropped her off and just give him enough rope and let him hang himself. Then hit him with all the charges. So disagree. He could have left. If he is arrested, he goes nowhere other than behind bars. And he had you done what you wanted him to do, he could have left. This is not a classy guy. He may not have been able to get far, but he may have gotten. Then away. if he leaves, you definitely know he did it. Consciousness of guilt. Flight. Flight. Got we got him. You got him before he, don't let him fly. We talked about it, guys. To be abused by someone that you love and trust. How hard that is. And now, to be her mother, Jennifer, and live with the fact that this man, Stefan Stearns, was a predator. And most likely the very reason why Madeline wanted to run and live in the woods and why she may not be here today. That man, Jennifer, loved so much and called a partner. And why I say so much is because, you know, you should see how controlling this man was. And we'll kind of get to that in a minute as well. Oh my God, this guy, control freak. Freak, but control freak too. But she loved this guy so much, right? This is her partner. And he was quite possibly the last person to have ever seen Madeline alive and to have caused Madeline unimaginable pain. And now we know that Madeline had been suffering for years under the roof of Jennifer. By the way, Jennifer was not able to attend Madeline's final birthday of her whole life, 13 years old. She was said to be away at work. So she missed her birthday, which means that Madeline was around family, but probably in his care while her mother was away at work. Makes the birthday situation very curious. You know, um, they didn't have the party on her birthday. So why would they pick a day when the mother wouldn't be there? You know, did the, did the uh, boyfriend pick the date because he wanted to be alone with her after her party? And now we know that he'd been doing this for a long, long time. Like, all they have is the evidence that's on the phone. I mean, how frequent was this going on when it wasn't on the phone? I don't think we'll ever know. And I was going to say it didn't make sense that he would just snap on her on February 26 of 2024. I was going to say that I was thinking this had been going on for a long time because usually with predators, that's just how it is. In my opinion, if somebody snaps, like you don't want to be in the room when that's going on, like you could be the one they snap on. But to 
uh, prey on a child. I feel like that's like a full throttle decision. So it's all adding up now how this guy was, this partner of Jennifer's. And I have no idea how Jennifer's going to live her life for the rest of it in knowing that she was housing a man that would hurt her child in the way that Stefan Stearns was hurting Madeline. And to think that this man was doing this all along and with absolute intent to cause harm to a child. Now I really have questions. And honestly, I have some questions toward Jennifer. I do. You were the mother. You had a responsibility. I am not placing blame. Like Jennifer, you got on national television and you were talking about the fact that your daughter has some mental issues. Like she's uh, potentially on the spectrum and that it's typical of her to be forgetful and that you know, she had ADHD, but was it really all those things? Or was it that she was dealing with trauma and secrets in her childhood that she could not talk to you about? The forgetfulness. The mom, that's her child. She has care, custody, and control of that child. So she's automatically being looked at, even by letting the boyfriend around the child. And so she's going to be scrutinized. Clearly, the boyfriend's actions are, are going to be charged. And she's going to be charged also by A, you know, adding, aiding and abetting him by giving that fake story to the news media. And I think they're gonna use that news media story against her when she has these fake crocodile tears. And you know, she doesn't act like- I didn't know she had listening. crocodile tears. I, I didn't see any tears, neither, but what no. I did see, I thought he was very credible. And if not for modern technology, of having all of the evidence on the phone. And by the way, I tell hey, people it never hey, goes away. Have you ever dabbed your eye and then you look at the tissue and there's no water there? Like, well, what was that? Because yeah. he had great Kleenex. What was that? <laughs> and had he called the lawyer, the lawyer would say, if well, you a minute. factory reset your phone, it's still there. We realized that she was never dropped off. So we, we come to realize that there was no embarrassment for his vehicle that morning because that whole situation like never happened. She was caught on surveillance at the condo complex, probably dead in his car, which probably means that he was, he like sat her upright in the car to look like uh, she was sleeping because that's actually what he said in his interview, that she slept most of the way. So she probably had her eyes closed, I imagine, and she, she probably was no longer here. She was an angel. It was just her body in that vehicle. And that's why I think that he couldn't look at the reporter when he was talking. And I think that he had this whole thing like in his head, how it's gonna go. Like, oh, I dropped her off over here in hopes that it would look like a cover. Well, if she had to walk a half mile and she never made it, that's not on me because she, she was embarrassed to me. She didn't want to be seen in my car. I, I'm a good I'm a good guy. I dropped her off. I honored her wishes. I let her sleep in the car. I told her I loved her. And as bad as that sounds to all of us that are learning about this family and this story, this is what I'm trying to tell you. Imagine the family, the family that was around Madeline on Sunday, the people that saw her and they were, they were hanging out with her when she was turning 13 and blowing out her candles, you guys, for two years. I think we have a better understanding of why Madeline wanted to run away to the woods. Stefan was supposed to show up for his first court appearance and he did not show up. His lawyer did, but he did not. I'm gonna go ahead and play for you a video and the guy in the background of this video is not him. So take a look. Steven Stearns or Stearns. Your Honor, at this time, I am going to waive Mr. Stearns' appearance. I'm also going to waive the reading of these charges. Mr. Stearns is aware of what he's been arrested for. Understood. So you got zero bond and 24 CF 632. Good luck to you. Thank and you. there's also, uh, I, is that two different cases? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Judge. Um, oh, yes. The, the, the second case is 24 CF 643, also zero bond. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, Judge. Do you, Honor, do you want no contact with um, family members or anyone? Y yes, uh, if there isn't already a no contact provision on those uh, on those warrants, I will include it. Okay, thank you. Sure. So on March 2nd of 2024, a post was made on social media about a community event for seniors. In that post, an investigative photo was accidentally leaked and the photo was immediately removed. An accidental release that happened and this was uh, a little bit disturbing, surprising. Um, and not welcomed, uh, I, I don't think, by the public in what happened here. It involves 
uh, a, a crime scene photo. This is from reporting from Fox 35, uh, a statement made by the sheriff. This is what the sheriff said. A post was made on social media about a community event for seniors. In the post, an investigative photo was accidentally included. The photo was immediately removed. We deeply apologize for any confusion or disturbance this may have caused. And that comes from the Osceola County Sheriff's Office. So what exactly was released here accidentally? Well, there's another post I want you to take a look at. This came from, um, I guess, a political opponent of that sheriff, the former sheriff who's running again, uh, former Osceola County Sheriff Russ Gibson posted this on Facebook. The second photograph that I received was an Instagram post made by Marcos Lopez himself. Um, this photograph was taken at an active crime scene where Madeline's body was recovered, and it was indeed a picture of Madeline's lifeless body. This is 100% unacceptable and 100% shameful and disrespectful to Madeline, her family, and friends. A picture from the crime scene posted accidentally of Madeline's lifeless body at the scene. All those types of images aren't allowed to be publicly disseminated in the state of Florida. And obviously there are issues on, on how it could impact family, friends, and others. Uh, ultimately, I don't think it will impact any trial or investigation. Um, then uh, uh, another post, or the same post, the sheriff continued, the first photo is a selfie of an Osceola Sheriff's Office civilian, Nerva La Sharifa Rodriguez, and the main suspect of the murder of Miss Madeline Soto as he's coming out of a building handcuffed. To post this photo for her own personal gain and notoriety is unacceptable and shameful. So here's what the former sheriff is talking about here. Um, this was a selfie that was uh, posted to Facebook. Although the post has since been deleted, um, that image was posted. And on it, you can see um, the suspect in the background coming out and then a selfie taken by a civilian working in the sheriff's office. Uh, not in great taste, not in great taste at all. And sort of unfortunate parts of what has transpired in this investigation so far. I'm really hoping that it's not leaking out everywhere because that's a minor and that's a person. So I'm really hoping that that photo just like dies down and does not resurface, but that's something that was said to have happened. But that man, Stefan Stearns, let's talk about him. And a lot of chatter and talk, uh, was this guy a Disney employee? Did he work for Disney? Now, if you go to his Facebook page, it, it's, it's pretty clear. He, he, he posts up there that he was in fact a cast member at Walt Disney World. And for those of you not familiar with what a cast member at Walt Disney World is, that's someone who works there. You don't have to be one of the characters wearing the costume. You just have to work um, at Disney and you're considered a cast member. So based upon that, a lot of folks are a little worried based upon um, the allegations he's facing now for those photographs on his cell phone that he was arrested for, sexual abuse. We believe that victim in those photos is Madeline, but working at Disney. So um, here's what the Orange Observer is reporting about whether or not he works at Disney. And despite information on the Facebook profile belonging to Stephen Stearns, the man arrested February 28th in the case of missing 13-year-old Madeline Soto was not a Disney cast member, officials confirmed. So we know that Madeline's family are in shock and a state of devastation about the news regarding both Madeline and Stefan Stearns. Jennifer Soto is said to be in hiding and listen, I don't know, you guys. The public, they're real upset. They feel they deserve answers because it just seemed like from afar, Jennifer let this happen. That's what it seems like to the public eye. And then she's asked us, the public, to help her with her daughter. And then she just vanished after going on national television saying 
we this, we that, we dropped her off when she wasn't even there. We held a party. She wasn't even there. Golly, it's starting to seem like Jennifer really wasn't there a lot, huh? Not for her uh, ride to school that morning, which I get that, you know, uh, husbands, spouses, partners, friends, neighbors, you know, they have a tendency to take children and make sure they get to school on time. And in Jennifer's defense, she had been with Stefan for a long time, but outside of her defense and the public's defense of the scrutiny, I do have to say a long time, you've been with them a long time and you weren't aware this was going on. I don't know, and she's in hiding. So I just feel like people are concerned and upset because a little girl has been harmed and she was getting harmed before her life came to a halt, to a tragic end. And people want answers, but she's nowhere to be found. Anyway, it's to my belief that authorities are probably going to have to reach out to her. She is going to need to cooperate if she doesn't want to be held accountable criminally. And maybe at that point in time, there might be some more answers that come out. Uh, Jen says... Uh, you know, that she had, there's a lot of conflict of who took him to school. Uh, first of all, I think it's all big, it's a whole big fabricated story. I don't think any of it is true. I think she was dead. When, when you're listening to the story unfold, it was, uh, we took them to school. Then it was, I took him to school. And then it was the boyfriend that took him to school. When you see all this disjointedness, when we analyze this, which we, I throw my team on it, we're all talking to each other and going, oh, I'm smelling a rat here. First of all, I think they're both involved. I think she's covering up for him. Well, That's let's, let's do this. Let's do this. Madeline's mother also spoke to WFTV Orlando mm -hmm. during that same interview. Let's watch that together. I feel like I can't breathe. All I keep thinking about is where is she? Is she safe? Is she okay? But we're... We're all a wreck. My entire family is a mess. We're just so worried. We dropped her off at school, close to school. Um, she wanted to walk the rest of the way. Um, I'm not sure what I'm allowed to share. I spotted walking uh, by the church, by the middle school. Uh, on the cameras. They saw her hang out in the parking lot for a little bit and then get up and leave. They didn't see a vehicle or anything else. They just saw her walk away uh, around 9 a.m. heading towards the school, but she never made it. In my heart, I feel like somebody took her. This isn't like her to just pick up and run away um, or just not go to school. Um, I don't, know, I don't know what to think. We are desperate for any answers, anything that you could do to help. I'm here for it. Just please, if, if you see my daughter, just please bring her home. I just hope you're okay, Maddie. I hope you're safe. I hope you're not hurt. hope she's okay. Well, first of all, she's in fight or flight. You see her really shaking. This is not your typical nervousness. This is a really, this is a shivering. Um, oftentimes you see that when somebody's really in trouble, right? You see them shaking like, if, you know, they're very, very nervous. That's really more of a nervous. You see her looking up a lot. We call the three corner white, but from the bottom, she's searching for answers. There's pauses in between her thoughts. She kind of loses her thought. She's then asking the interviewer about what she should say or what she shouldn't say, or maybe I shouldn't say it. Um, that's really odd because that would almost imply that she was talking to an attorney or something that she was kind of prohibited in saying something. Uh, the other thing is to, is again, remember the, uh, uh, she saw her going across the street, we dropped her off. I think that she did, but it wasn't that day. And this is what liars do. And Casey Anthony was really good at this. She would play out at things in her mind that had happened to occur before, or that she visualized it, somebody else doing it, but putting herself in that situation. So I am telling you right now, Vinny, and I will bet my career on it. The mother's involved. She's covering it up for the boyfriend. I don't think she had anything to do with it, but I think there was a high conflict between her and that birthday party when you look at the language and there there was a conflict between the mother and the daughter I even asked 
Fox 35, I said, hey, what's going on with this relationship with mother-daughter? There's a high conflict. Why? Because early on, you could listen to her tone. There were, and, the, and there's a lot of videos. It shows an agitation, almost some anger that I could hear in the back of her voice. So there's a, the other thing is there's no tears, there's no sadness, there's no remorse. And I have to ask you a question, Vinny, and any of your viewers out there, did you feel any emotion there? No. There you go. We didn't. We didn't. Mm -hmm. We didn't. Um, and I, I hate, and, and again, no one's been charged at all in, in mm -hmm. what has happened to her. We only know about the charges relative to the cell phone. The investigation continues, um, but it's a big part of the investigation. Um, what was going on in the house? What's going on with the relationships? All <clears throat> significant stuff. However, I do have to say that Jennifer's Facebook page has been changed. I'm not gonna feature that here because I do not believe in my heart the right thing is to go antagonize her and come for her right now. She has been active on Facebook. Her Facebook name was changed to something completely different. I did find it. I was able to discover that there is a photo of Jennifer that she has not removed that has Stefan Stearns in the background, which is another creepy aspect of this predator, was he was always lurking somewhere. He was just a freaking creep. It's been confirmed he's a predator, so my hope in my heart of hearts is that she will remove this photo. She should have zero affiliation with this guy. I don't even care if he's in the background. I, I don't personally care. I don't think the public really cares about that either. I think that the public, if you're going to stay active on social media and they, they can find you like I did, I think it's really important to get off social media or maybe come out and give uh, some answers because um, there's a little girl that, that has died. And I feel like a lot of people are feeling responsible for that right now. I can understand a little bit why people are upset. Why are you still on social media? Why is your daughter not here? And what's going on with this photo that's still posted where he's in the background? So per the wrap of the video, we're gonna go out with a bang because Madeline deserves it. So we cannot prove that anyone is guilty or innocent here in reference to the murder of Madeline. I know it's hard, but we can't do it. We're not the authorities. However, I believe, uh, like my life, on my life, that Stephen is guilty and here is why. The law was passed in Florida for the death penalty for those convicted of SA or this before a child would be the age of 12. It's weird. Now it's just been confirmed that this had been going on before she turned 13. They're in Florida. This guy is probably going to be getting the death penalty. It's weird for me that Madeline would say that she wanted to leave home by the time she turned 13. Obviously, this guy, this predator, was committing a huge crime, a big one in Florida. So do you guys think that he had done this a lot more off camera? Because I do. Do you guys think that he had been doing it since the beginning of time. I don't know how long uh, Jennifer and Stefan were together, but if it was beyond two years, I think this started right away. I do not feel in my heart that Madeline was the first. I think there was a lot of things that are gonna be off camera that we're not gonna know. And for the things that we do know, this guy is completely finished. And I really think, based on what I'd heard someone else say, that there is a really big chance that's why he ended her life because as she was gonna age, she was gonna talk. This was gonna come out at some point. And so it would go on and on and on until she would speak, right? He wasn't gonna stop himself. The guy's sick, he had a problem. And at some point he was gonna get caught and he was gonna face a death penalty no matter what. So that's the story, guys. That's Madeline Soto's story. What do you guys think? I was seeing a lot of people talk about how uh, single parents they choose charming men to bring them in and, and help raise up a family because I'll be honest, I was a single mom at one point. I understand meeting people and building trust with someone and eventually sharing a family with that person. I know all about that. But that's where I really honestly think that Madeline was showing signs of trauma. This kind of thing, I mean, okay, we don't know all the facts, but it seems like this is the kind of thing that is happening really more often than people realize, where a single mother who's alone, who's lonely, uh, who has low self-esteem, um, gets targeted by a sexual perpetrator. 
and they look from situations like this. And, um, and sometimes the mother knows what's going on, you know, that they're having sex and sometimes they don't. But when they do know, you know, they decide, uh, I mean, well, some mothers actually, you know, call the police and right away and, and take care of the problem. But um, some mothers just turn, you know, are in denial or turn a blind eye um, because they don't want to lose the relationship. So basically they're, they're you know, selling their da daughter out. Uh, sometimes it happens with sons too, for that matter. They're selling them out so that they can stay in this relationship, whether it's for financial reasons or emotional reasons. But so we don't know yet what this story is with this mother. Let, let me ask you this, is it possible that the victim, Madeline, in, in this case, you know, this goes back to at least August of 2022 is what uh, investigators believe. Is it possible that she wouldn't tell her mom or there wouldn't be obvious signs to a mother that this is happening in this house? Well, you know, going on for two years, I mean, 11 to 13, um, at least, at least that's where the pictures come from. Um, you know, and being in the same house, it seems very unlikely that she wouldn't have seen clues. Um, you know, the, the daughter may not have told her. And, and that's, you know, there are all these psychological deep reasons for things like sometimes, you know, children do tell right away or sometimes they tell eventually um, because they wanted to stop. Uh, but sometimes they're afraid, they're ashamed, they blame themselves. Um, you know, and sometimes they know, they recognize that the mother wants to stay with the man. So they, you know, don't want to ruin things. Sometimes they don't want to ruin the financial situation. Um, so, you know, you would think, I mean, of course, they have four bedrooms. So that may, maybe made it a little harder. But you would think that she would have walked in on them at some time. Most of the time, there are patterns that come with these types of behaviors when a child is forgetful and this, that, and the other. Are they really though, or is something going on? When did Stefan start displaying his behavioral issues? Because we all know that he's got them. I can see it on the camera. I can see it in his photos. The guy's a weirdo. So if you're single and you're dating someone or you've been divorced and you're starting over completely, I don't know, man. All I can say is get close to your children. Keep them close. Like, helicopter parent. I don't give a shit. I've been called that before. It's not insulting to me. My kids would never be in that situation. And this is not to judge another parent. I'm just saying I would rather be the controlling parent that overdoes it before I'm the mother that's learning that my daughter or my son were keeping really bad secrets from me because somebody else had that much control over my child, over my child's being. Love from a parent to a child should be a bond that you know in your heart of hearts cannot be broken, even over an evil deed where somebody says, shh, don't tell anyone or I'll hurt you. Don't tell anyone or this is gonna happen to you, that's gonna happen to you. Don't say anything. There should be nothing between parents and children where the child is in harm's way and the child cannot go to the parent and be honest. It seriously wrecks me that Madeline went out the way that she did, that she was keeping so many secrets from her mother. That makes me so sad. So anyway, as more unfolds with this story, I will be updating you in the community tab. There's not much more to say about it besides something really bad has happened how can we learn from this as a nation, as a society, within our community, within the home of our family? Like, how can we learn? How can we avoid ignoring these signs and symptoms of a child going through something where they feel like they're being silenced? Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Ooh, it was heavy, but thank you for trusting me with this. And I will be seeing you next week for another case. I'm Chelsea J. Crime Light Out. <laughs> <laughs>